pray with me. Loving God, thank you for just the opportunity that you have given us to have a body um, and for the opportunity for us to participate in the wider body of Christ. Um, help us to care for ourselves, care for one another, because you care for us. We ask this in the name of Jesus, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, Jonah. Oh, I, there are lots and lots of reasons why I think everyone loves Jonah, which not so coincidentally is why it's a really a favorite story for both little children and for us adults. On the surface, the story's pretty understandable. Jonah comes across, he's like really relatable, he's like taking control of his own life, he's confident. We've got these four very short chapters about a hero and then some villains from an evil city. It is an epic tale. I mean, what could go wrong? Okay, a, a couple things do go wrong, I'll admit. Actually, it's probably more than just a couple of things. All right, fine. By the end of the story, everything has gone completely wrong for Jonah. But grab your bulletins, if you will, turn to your first reading, which is from Jonah, and look at the first sentence in that reading, because we are given a glimpse of just how far off the rails things have gone for Jonah. Chapter 3, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah for a second time. Uh-oh. Someone's not been listening very well, huh? Well, what happened the first time the word of the Lord came to Jonah? I mean, if you flip back in the Bible a page or two, back to the beginning of chapter 1, God tells Jonah to go to that great city of Nineveh. And let me tell you, Nineveh is great. As in, it's huge and it's powerful and full of Assyrians who have destroyed and kidnapped and enslaved and murdered and basically ripped apart anybody who has gotten in their way, including Jonah's people, the Hebrews. And many of us know how the story goes from there. God says, go. Jonah says, no. And then he attempts to flee from the presence of God, which is adorable. Because where is that? To make a short story even shorter, Jonah doesn't want to die at the hands of the people that he already hates. So he hops on a ship, sails in the opposite direction of Nineveh, gets caught in a storm, thrown overboard, and ends up in a big fish. Which is the part of the story that everyone knows and loves. Because come on, what's better than a story where the hero winds up covered in smelly fish vomit on a beach at halftime? Now we don't, we don't usually like to talk about fish vomit. But we probably should, because it really does serve a purpose for Jonah and for us. The definition of repentance is to turn, like to turn in a new or a different direction. If you repent, you don't keep going in the same way that you've been going. You, you pivot. You turn. You find a new way. For Jonah, we could tell his story in terms of BFV and AFV. Before fish vomit and after fish vomit. He was attempting to get away from the presence of God, enter the fish vomit, and now he's headed towards Nineveh where God told him to go. Jonah turned, he found a new way, he repented. And you can, you can imagine the scene, can't you? Like as he's getting up to the gates of Nineveh, like walking through them, he's probably really afraid. His tail's kind of tucked between his legs. He's embarrassed. He stinks. On top of that, he only uses eight words of prophecy as he sort of meanders and strolls his way towards the center of the city. There's no hope in his words. There's no direction. There's no good news for anyone. He is underachieving seemingly on purpose. Like he's not, 
He's not good at his job. He's a prophet of God, and he's not very good. But here's the thing, and there's really no way of getting around this. It didn't matter to God how Jonah felt. Because it just so happens that the mercy of God extends even to Nineveh. And Jonah knew this. In fact, it's the reason why he ran away in the first place. If you go to the last chapter of the story, Jonah confesses to God that he knew God's mercy was limitless. I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, he said, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from punishment. That word relenting, the Hebrew word is naham. Now, I mentioned earlier that after the fish vomit, Jonah turned, found a new way. He repented. Naham in the scriptures almost always means repent. Even though Jonah, who was a prophet of God, and he hated and he feared and he disliked and he wanted the Assyrians in Nineveh wiped off the map, even in spite of that, God relented. God found another way. God repented. This is incredibly good news for us, for everyone, like all people. And you might be asking, oh, uh, why? Why, why is that good news? Lutheran pastor Caitlin Trussell gives the following reason on why this is good news for us. Quote, because God is bigger than our grudges and the people we hold grudges against. God loves the people we can't love. End quote. I'm not going to lie to you all. It is not easy to come to terms with the truth that the people we don't like, like the ones we would might spend like a lifetime opposing or even hating, we don't like to entertain the fact that they are just as worthy of God's love and mercy. But we also then have to be honest, because if they're not worthy, then neither are we. This is the scandalous nature of God's love for all particularly when you see it through the filter of the way of Jesus. And again, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, you and I are both very, very likely of being guilty of going to great lengths to try and not extend love and mercy to those people. You know who I'm talking about. The ones who deserve the very thing that Jonah wanted to see happen to the Ninevites. We can sit here and we can chuckle and sort of oh, shake our heads at Jonah as long as we then look around at our fellow church members and in the mirror and we admit that we want the same thing. We want what Jonah wanted. Which brings us to our need to turn, to find another way, to repent. Which brings us to Jesus. In our gospel passage this morning, from the first chapter of Mark, we hear Jesus as he calls some of his first disciples. But before that, he announces the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. It would be oh so very easy to read those words and as Christians believe that the call for repentance was for those people. I mean, how simple would it be for us as Christians to believe that the way to bring about God's kingdom is to use the tactics of the Assyrians or of Jonah and battle one another, to tear one another down, to use political power or force to get others to do or not to do what we want, to see those people as an enemy, to choose violence. But the kingdom of God that Jesus announces is not one of violence, but mercy. It's not about power, but rather powerlessness. It's that kingdom where faith, hope, and love are the things that produce light 
and life. Now, none of us have this all figured out, least of all me. We all need to turn. We all need to find another way. We all have the need to repent. And it's actually through the waters of our baptism that each of us are sort of washed into this new way. And we're invited, in the words of our baptismal covenant, to continuously return to that new way when we miss the mark. Will you persevere in resisting evil? And whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. I will with God's help. Now, at the back of our sanctuary here at St. Thomas is our baptismal font. And this morning, there's holy water in it. You are invited, maybe before you come up for communion, maybe after you take communion, or as you leave this space this morning, to make your way to the font, dip your fingers into that holy water, in the waters of baptism, and make the sign of the cross upon you, and refocus yourself. Recommit. Rededicate. Repent. And be re-welcomed back into the kingdom and love of God. And I promise, it's holy water, not fish vomit. Amen. <laughs>